Welcome back, everybody. My name's Tommy McCarthy, and this is Let's Talk Cyber. And in front of me is none other than Seltanat. She joined me in Dubai a few months ago, spent a little bit of time telling us a little bit about what's going on in her world. But Seltanat, welcome back to Let's Talk Cyber. Oh, hi, Tommy. I'm super excited to be here. Wonderful, Seltanat. Listen, for the benefit of our listeners, because I didn't ask you this last time we met in the studio, could you give us a little bit of a background about Seltanat, where you've come from? How did you get into this space, Critical National? infrastructure and OT? Sure. So I work as a global product management lead at Honeywell. So my responsibility is I'm responsible for new product initiatives for OT cybersecurity solutions. And my bio is quite long, but um, in a summary, I can tell that uh, I've grown up in an oil and gas city back in Kazakhstan. So uh, being in OT world is quite natural for me. Um, so, from the education perspective, I've graduated, my bachelor's degree is in electrical engineering, then uh, my master's degree in more network systems, and then I've done in IT first, then um, cybersecurity, and then I transitioned to the OT cybersecurity. So, in OT cybersecurity, I came from the on-site experience, so I used to do on-site uh, network assessments, uh, I've been involved in FAT and SAT and so on and so forth. Then I moved to the Center of Excellence in Dubai, where I have executed numerous cyber physical risk assessment around the globe. And now I'm in my another role, which is a product management lead. And apart from that, I've been involved in global OT cybersecurity communities um, in Asia Pac, in Europe, in the US and Middle East as well. Well, Saltanat, it's funny you made reference to, you know, originally starting your career in oil and gas. And yes, Tengi Chevroil, I know it well. So Kazakhstan was a, was a country I visited in a previous, a previous life. So yeah, I know what an unbelievable, huge oil refinery that is. Massive. I couldn't believe the size of it. it took me all day to get around it. So I'm sure you had your work cut out. Well, you've come a long way. You're now living in Dubai. You're jumping all around the globe. You, you seem to be here, there, and everywhere. Tell me a little bit about some of the cybersecurity trends uh, that are having an impact on CNI and OT right now. What are you identifying? What are you seeing? What are the trends that are, that are having an impact? Sure. So I would say if I take like last two years, uh, most trends, I, I would say it's AI. So we can talk about first that AI is driving the efficiency, is driving the real business outcome for critical national infrastructure, such as um, optimization, sustainability in cybersecurity and workforce development. But with this efficiency with the AI, um, we need to have a more data, more data sources. It means more connectivity. So what we're seeing right now is we're having a lot of bidirectional connections, which is expanding the risks in uh, critical national infrastructure, uh, which means that we need to come up with uh, correct, I would say the proper cyber physical risk assessment methodology and make sure that we're focusing on the high consequence events. And that from the second thing is that in terms of AI, right now AI from the uh, attacker's perspective that AI is making their life easier. So before it used to be OT cybersecurity was quite closed. And then most of them were proprietary software, proprietary protocols, but, and then the crafting the malware, it was quite complicated. Attackers needed to have special skills. But right now with AI, they don't have to have those skills because AI is helping them to craft this malware in a couple of minutes. So. This is one of the trends. Another trend, I would say, because OT cybersecurity is becoming quick right now because of the uh, attack surfaces increasing, ransomware attacks are increasing, supply chain risks. We need workforce, meaning that uh, in specifically OT cybersecurity, a lot of asset owners are struggling uh, having access to the experts in this field because these experts need to have a skills of both IT world and both OT world. When I say OT, it means you need to, they need to have a knowledge of functional safety. They need to have a knowledge of the process, automation, infrastructure, 
so on and so forth. Well, it's interesting, Sultan. It's interesting that you say that AI is obviously one of the main trends that you're witnessing now. Just about everybody that we've spoken to has expressed either the the joy about the use of AI within the workplace or their concerns about the use of AI from our adversaries and none more so than His Excellency Dr. Mohammed al Kuwaiti, who you'll be familiar with, uh, who, who obviously is one of the figureheads in the UAE. Now we've just had the opportunity to look at, for the first time, the um, UAE's national cybersecurity strategy. Is there anything that st stands out there, Sultanat, from your own point of view? Have you had a chance to reflect on what the impact's going to be in your world from the you know from the national security strategy yeah so uh, uae national cybersecurity strategy has a five pillars and then it aims to establish a secure and resilient cyber infrastructure that supports national growth and projects critical six sectors for me the key component of this strategy i would say the critical information infrastructure protection program that program focuses on safeguarding essential sectors such as energy, IST, government services, electricity and water, um, health services, transportation, food and agriculture. So this strategy emphasized implementing comprehensive legal and regulatory frameworks to address all types of cyber crimes, ensuring the security of both uh, existing and emerging technologies, supporting the small and medium sized enterprises against common cyber threats. So uh, in OT, this strategy advocates the key several measures. I mean, it's very long, but I can say that this mostly include the network segmentation to isolate the critical OT networks, strict access controls, regular vulnerability assessment and timely patching, uh, deploying the intrusion detection systems and so on and so forth. So it's a huge program, but I really like that they're they're mainly focusing on the critical national infrastructure uh, uh, scope. Yeah, and, and go on just by your own assessment, I did take time to read it a few times and, and there's a lot of information to take on board. You're absolutely right. But it would seem to me that they've not left anything out when it comes to critical national infrastructure. They've given a lot of consideration, as you've quite rightly said, to every impact, every every potential threat and hazard that you would expect to be aware of. I think the CNI is pretty well covered. Would you not agree? Indeed. It's a huge, yeah. I would say it's Good. a huge document. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Is. It's great to see them leading the way uh, in in the manner that they have. I mean, they, they do nothing in halves, in half measures in the UAE, that's for sure. I guess one of the issues for me is that, let's say, for instance, if an asset owner understands the importance of OT, um, cybersecurity, but is uncertain of how to proceed, what kind of uh, step would you recommend for an asset owner that understands OT is going to be absolutely critical for their own operations, but, you know, are quite uncertain of to, you know, where they should go first. What kind of recommend recommendations have you got for them? Sure. So this is what, because I mean, I do the, I travel all around the globe and I meet different, different asset owners, oil and gas, manufacturing, chemical plants, refineries, water, so on and so forth. So the first thing I advise is that, okay, now you're going to start your journey in OT cybersecurity strategy. The first, you have to make sure that are you, do you have to comply uh, a regulatory or legal mandates in your industry. So first you have to identify what is your geographic region. If it's a UAE, then you have to comply with this strategy. Or if it's a U uh, Europe, it's a NIS nice too. And then uh, based on the geographic region and based on the industry, if, you're, if you have to comply with legal mandates, then you need to start from that legal mandates. What does it say? The compliance controls. But if you find out that you there is no legal mandate to your industry, but you still face the threats, you can start with the best practices because no matter what, regulation uh, all around the globe, all the countries are enacting uh, regulation. So you can start with ISA 62443 or NIST-CSF or CTM to all these best practice standards and go ahead and start applying this into your environment. And then third step, I would say, if you say, oh, I don't have the resources to comply with the standard and I don't have time for that, can you give me the quick win? 
So I would say there are a lot of guidelines for the quick win. For example, I really like SANS 5 critical controls where it says, those are the five critical controls based on the survey. Go ahead and apply them in order to have a quick win. So this is a three types of strategy that you should start uh, uh, applying, not going and deploying the solution right away. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, the amount of work involved, Salton, in, in, in even considering adopting a standard li like the, you know, NIST 2 or even ISO 27001, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's no small measure. It's a lot of work involved. And if you don't have the infrastructure, like you've just said, then, you know, you've got to start small. So I agree completely. One of the things that's becoming more and more apparent and is being taken quite seriously in, in the region, the UAE, is governance, risk and compliance. Do you GRC. Could you just give us your own little view on GRC? Tell us a little bit about your own opinion about GRC. Yeah, sure. So I haven't mentioned in my bio, so apart from cyber physical risk assessment, I have also developed an approach to disaster recovery in OT. This is a framework and uh, I mean, it's free to use for many asset owners. So while developing this and while executing cyber physical risk assessment, I found out that the in OT specifically, GRC is lacking. They rely on IT side, but when I try to work on IT side of the GRC, it doesn't apply to the OT. There is a huge differences, even from the standards perspective, from DCP, DRP perspective, from risk perspective as well. So, so therefore, um, asset owners need to start from the uh, uh, looking GRC from the perspective of the OT. So when we talk about go it's a governance, risk, and compliance, let's take up about the compliance because right now, according to the report from World Economic Forum, 76% of the CISOs said that the main challenge right now is to meet the compliance requirements. So therefore, I would say in GRC, a lot of asset owners worry about compliance. And compliance up to now is, right now, is a uh, ad hoc and the spreadsheets, and then there are more, uh, it's not a risk-based approach. That's why asset owners need to think from the compliance perspective, it should be continuous compliance and it must be the risk-based compliance. And when it comes to the pillar of the uh, risk, the asset owners need to think from the risk perspective, it's not just a cyber risk. It must be tied onto the physical process. So it so it must be cyber physical risk. So they have to work with the process safety in order to identify their real impact, real consequence. The third, I would say the governance, when you think about the governance, a lot of time asset owners, the policy procedures, they rely on IT. Then they found out that those policies, such as incident response policy or cybersecurity policy, doesn't cover the OT scope. That's why they need to make sure that they, they, they do have those policies and procedures in the governance, and then they do have uh, BCP and DRP, because risk, right now a lot of government, uh, including the UAE, they're promoting the resiliency, meaning that in case of an attack, how resilient you are. Can you recover as quick as possible with minimal impact or can you respond to an attack? Wow, so, Salton, I already we've touched on quite a number of different uh, governance standards, compliance requirements, not to mention the, the National Cybersecurity Strategy, the UAE. Well, what, what does a successful program look like? And more importantly, not just what does a successful program look like, how can Honeywell support a successful program in this particular space? Have you got a, a view on that for me? Sure. So, so first of all, I would like to say Honeywell, we're not, not a small company. We're also OEM. So I would say we do have our, our manufacturing size all around the globe. The same problems that asset owners face, we do face as well, like a compliance uh, challenges, lack of harmonization between the uh, countries in terms of regulation, and then OT threats, all of these problems we do face as well. And then all of our end-to-end -end OT cybersecurity solutions, we go ahead and test into our uh, manufacturing sites first in order to make sure that we don't have much false positive, we do have um, proper asset inventory, and then we are meeting the compliance requirements. So the first we do face as well uh, before giving to the asset owners. So what successful program looks like is uh, having end-to-end -end 
proper OT cybersecurity program. So you usually start with, as I said prior, with the assessment or with the compliance requirements. So we are, as Honeywell, we do provide, we don't just provide just one tool, we do provide, we do have professional services starting from the cyber physical risk assessment, vulnerability assessment. Then we do have our own tools such as um, Cyber Insight, which is a detection tool, and then SMX, which is from the USB protection tool. Then we have our own MSS and OT SOC and an incident response. So if we take about take the NIS, so we do have from the identify to the recovery phase. So the successful program should be for the asset owner is to start with the identify to make sure that you cover all of the pillars on the NIS CSF framework. Or if we take the ISA 62. 2443, there are four tires. Um, so one is for asset owner, one for integrators, one for suppliers. So you want to make sure all of your pro most of your uh, automation products are certified against IC 62443. And then you follow the IC 62443 guideline. And again, as a Honeywell, we do have IC 62443 certification. And plus, we do have all of these end to end solutions to our. Uh, to the asset owners. And again, Honeywell is an OT company and we are only focused purely in OT. Well, it would seem to me, it's fair to say that you guys, especially Honeywell, have got it all covered. And some people don't like this phrase, but I would definitely say when it comes to OT and CNI, you guys are a one-stop shop. I mean, you've got everything covered. You know, I was going to ask you for a call to action, obviously looking at how people would engage with Honeywell. I know that obviously, first and foremost, they could just jump onto your website, reach out to you on social media. But we're going to be at JISEC, Saltanat, very, very shortly. And I know that uh, Honeywell have got a big part to play in the CNI hall uh, and in the conference itself. So, you know, um, will you be there yourself? Can people come along and meet you at the Honeywell stand? Yeah, sure. I will be there. Please come to JISEC, uh, in JISEC Honeywell stand. And then if you have any questions, just reach out to me or my colleagues. Or if you just want to chat from the knowledge perspective, I'm also available. I will be in JISEC. I have canceled all my other world <laughs> wars Tours? in order yeah. to be in a JISEC. And then sometimes people ask, why you know a lot, why you have a lot of knowledge in OT? What is your key? How can I do that? I think it's a lot of them is thanks to Honeywell because I'm a lot of exposed globally to OT cybersecurity asset, OT asset owners. Yeah, well, I have to admit, Sultan, it's not the first time we've met. We've met a few times in Scotland when you were over here with Honeywell. You know, um, Dubai last year at JISEC, the year before. We are delighted to be having the support this year from uh, from Honeywell and from yourself. And I can't thank you guys enough for getting on board and support and Let's Talk Cyber. So be rest assured, we will be over in Hall, I think it's three actually, where Honeywell will be based at the CNI Hall. Oh, Saltanat, all it remains for me to say on behalf of Let's Talk Cyber is thank you and thank Honeywell so much for joining us today on Let's Talk Cyber. Thank you, Doug.